All right, guys. Uh, so today's talk, I'm going to be giving on machine learning versus uh, crypto coin miners. Uh, when I say machine learning, what I'm actually doing mostly is statistical analysis. I'll dig into that a little bit more. Um, but the whole purpose of this talk that I really wanted to get into is to kind of demystify a lot of the things that go on behind the scenes when it comes to machine learning. Uh, how many people here are actively involved in security as part of their main job? So a good number of you. Okay, so before we got into security, it kind of has like this black magic, ethereal kind of vibe to it where it's it's all sorcery. And so you pop open the hood and it makes complete and total sense. It's, it's nothing magic. There's nothing crazy about it. It's pretty straightforward and easy once you pick up on it. Machine learning is the same way. It's very logical. It's very straightforward. All it is is just learning the tools that come with it and being willing to do the research and to dig into it. Um, and so I, I dug into this because I wanted to take that initiative personally. I don't have a math background of any kind. I think it's fascinating, but I didn't study math in school, although I studied computer science. Um, so that, that's really why I started digging into this, and I really want to try blending uh, those two fields together because I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, so quick about me. My name is John Callahan. I work for an AppSec consultancy out in Washington, D.C. Uh, huge Python nerd, always have been. Uh, recently, I've been picking up a lot of Golang. I find the language absolutely fascinating. Step over so you guys can see. Um, like I said, I love math. I will openly admit that I am terrible at it, and I liken myself to a mathematical skid. I pull up NumPy or SciPy and just plug things into the algorithms there. I don't implement anything by myself because I'm terrible at math. Um, and I'm a huge metalhead. So if you want to talk metal afterwards, my European brothers, come up and talk. Nobody <laughs> in America listens to good music. I would love to talk with it. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, machine learning. Great buzzword. It's like blockchain. 90% of the time people use it, it's not actually what it is. I mean, I found this on Twitter, a great meme. Uh, there's an if statement. Obviously, it's machine learning now. Uh, so uh, a lot of the times, in what in machine learning to a lot of people means deep learning, like neural networks or GONs or current neural networks, that, that kind of stuff. I didn't use any of that. Um, they have their place. I have pretty strong opinions on why you shouldn't use them. And if you want to talk about that afterwards, I'd absolutely be open to it. Uh, but in this case, I'm just doing straight stats, and I'm just building a model by looking at a set of data points and trying to quantify their pattern and how they manifest. Um, so, uh, quick intro. So again, the, the whole point of this is to be able to build a model that's able to consume network logs and s determine whether or not there's a crypto coin miner on your network. Uh, I'm a huge AWS fan as well. I've really been into that the last few years, so I specifically targeted that. Uh, so if you're familiar, I'm working with VPC flow logs. Um, I'm also specifically focusing on CPU miners. And again, because my environment is AWS, preventing GPU mining is really easy. Just block the GPU instances. Almost no one out there has a reason to have GPU mi or GPU instances running on their network it's, it's, since they're so niche. Um, so you really don't have to worry about that. You have to be more worried about CPU mining, uh, which these days is really just two coins, Monero and Varium. Um, but at the same time, the behavior of those coins is identical uh, for those who aren't big into the crypto coin community. Mining occurs over a protocol called Stratum. Uh, so really what I'm fingerprinting and what I'm building a model off of is off of the Stratum protocol. Um, so uh, AWS VPC flow logs are uh, interesting. They provide an interesting challenge for, uh, for what I'm doing. Um, but, oh, I guess I should go over my starting data. So... What I'm working with is I had I built a bunch of miners using all the C4 instance types and just let them run for like 24 hours against uh, a mining pool and just logged all the, the VPC traffic and pulled it down locally. Um, and then I had a, a colleague of mine was kind enough to donate three weeks worth of VPC flow logs to me that I could use as my counterpoint of data. So this is all my non-mining traffic and here's all my mining traffic. And I can just basically just diffing the two of them and seeing where the, the biggest differences between those two sets of data lie and then building a model off of that. Um, so for my non-mining traffic, I had about 82,000 82, sets of traffic, um, uh, unique by IP, meaning uh, one IP talking to another, because uh, VPC flow logs are uh, unidirectional. You only get one direction. So if you want to capture TCP traffic, you actually have to marry up logs together, and you actually have to parse them and massage them so you can correlate. Um, I have one set of logs from uh, IP1 to IP2 and another set of logs for IP2 to IP1. So I have to, I have to massage that data and marry them together. Uh, and that was spread across about a thousand different unique uh, ENIs, which are uh, virtual NICs, if you're not familiar. Uh, so for VPC flow logs, uh, the interesting thing about them is they're not 
uh, they're not packet layer captures. What they are is they're aggregate data over a 10 minute window. So instead of being able to see every time a packet gets sent and received, instead I can see over 10 minutes, IP1 sent 100 packets to IP2, and over those 100 packets, it was 100 meg. Um, and I can see uh, what ports they were talking to as well. Um, so that provides an interesting challenge. This fingerprinting would be a lot easier if I had per packet data, um, like a lot of socks do traditionally. So that was another reason I chose to go the AWS route, is because I don't have very detailed granular information. Instead, I'm looking at broad spectrum and broad data, uh, which makes it a little bit more difficult to actually define patterns, uh, which, well, didn't turn out to be that difficult, but I thought it might be. Um, and then at the bottom here, this is just uh, this is the structure of a of a flow log entry. It's space separated, um, and this is the, an example of one. So version two is just the standard version. That's what they're using right now. Account ID is your AWS account ID. Then you have your uh, virtual NIC ID, uh, the the two address the, or the source address, the destination destination address, source port, destination port. Uh, mm -hmm. Protocol uh, correlates to your layer five protocol. So in this case, six is TCP. Uh, so that's the one I care about, uh, as well as a couple other things, uh, action log status, you don't really have to worry about it all. Um, and then start and end are just uh, Unix time since, uh, or second since epoch timestamps. Uh, so that's that's the data I'm working with. I had uh, like 70, 80,000 or so separate entries of this line right here that I had to go through and parse and massage. Um, so like I, like I said, I need to actually go and reorganize that data. Because as it is, it's not workable. I need to structure that in some way that I can um, uh, basically rebuild TCP streams uh, since they're bidirectional. Uh, so that was the first thing I had to do. Um, I, well, right off the bat, I also filtered out reject traffic. So down here, we can see accept. Accept just means the traffic was able to actually get outbound. You weren't violating any knuckles or security group rules or anything like that. The traffic successfully got out of the network. Um, and since I only care about active miners, Right off the bat, I just blew away everything that was labeled reject because I don't care about it at the moment. Uh, the model right now will be specifically for active traffic. So filtered out reject right off the bat. Um, and then I organized by IP and protocol pairs. Um, so basically what I did is for every one of these, every one of these entries, I looked for where the IP addresses lined up uh, alternatively and married those together according to timestamps down here. Um, so that's how I would know that the communication was going. Um, th this over this ten minute window, this TCP stream occurred. I can marry those logs together. I ignored ports. I went specifically for IP address to IP address, and my logic for that was if a adversary is on your network and mining traffic, the only thing they're going to be sending to a mining pool is mining traffic. They're not going to be sending anything else. They're going to have your client connecting to port. 5555 five, five, five or whatever, and that's it. There's nothing else going over there. So it's pretty safe to just organize by IP address and ignore ports altogether. If I see um, a client talking to another client and they're using 30 different ports, safe to say that it's probably not mining traffic. Um, if it is, uh, eventually that should get filtered out and we'll get down to the point where the client is just sending traffic over a single destination port. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so after I got all that aggregated, um, then that's when I started actually going through and trying to build a model. Uh, so the way this works is I've got eight, eight dimensions of data, eight pieces of data that I can have. Since I massage this all down, I have the number of bytes that were sent by source and destination, number of packets, number of unique ports, and the length that the communication occurred over. Uh, so that gives me eight different dimensions to work with. Um, and from there, uh, the, the general idea is to take that data, take my mining data, and just graph it out and just eyeball it and say, I can see clustering happening around this kind of point. If I graph out some other random data, is it clustering in the same place or is it clustering somewhere else? And then just iteratively go through trying to eyeball these patterns, implement them into Python, and then filter out all the non-mining traffic until eventually I had zero false positives left. I will fully admit this is not a complete or full uh model building strategy. There are more steps to be done here, but for an amateur level, just tinkering around and playing with stuff, it, it worked well enough. Um, so, and I end up with like three different filters or so. It didn't take too much. Uh, so right off the bat, you can do some really easy stuff. Uh, again, like I mentioned, like number of unique destination ports. If a mining client is talking to a mining server, it's only going to be talking to one specific port. It's going to be reaching out to one specific destination port. 
the source port may change because the client is using ephemeral ports. Uh, so over a point, over 24 hours, it might use three or four ephemeral ports, but it's always going to be connecting to the same destination 5555 or whatever it is the pool is using. Um, so that right there gives us a nice little filter check. We can just filter out anything that has a massive amount of destination ports on it. We know that's not mining traffic. That's some other server that's consuming a lot of different kinds of data. Um, this really didn't get me too far just because of the kind of test data I have. This filtered out 200 streams uh, of 38,000. So it was a pretty minor check. That said, this is, that's completely reliant on the test data I have. There may be other environments in which that is an extremely effective tool of easily stripping things out. For the test data I had, it didn't do too much, but it was extremely computationally cheap. Um, I don't have to do any kind of stats or major linear algebra or anything like that. It's just check and, uh, check and delete. Uh, so when things get interesting as we start graphing things out, uh, we obviously live in a three-dimensional world, uh, and I'm going to be sticking to two-dimensional data for the most part just because it's very easy to visualize. Um, so the idea is let's graph some stuff out, look for patterns, and then try and build models off of that to filter out other things. Uh, so the first one is the number of source bytes versus the number of source packets. And these are six of my uh, mining clients right here that are just, it's just looping back and forth. Um, so right off the bat, there's some pretty obvious patterns. I mean, you can tell that there's a very strong linear cor correlation between the two um, along this line, which is good. That's, we have a strong correlation between the two. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this well enough, but there's also some pretty strong striation patterning. Uh, nope, go back. So we can see like groupings coming up in lines here. That's another very good pattern right there, assuming that that, isn't, uh, that doesn't manifest in other kinds of traffic. Um, if it's not, if it's as unique as I would think it would be, that'd be a very good point to build a model off of because you're not gonna see on anything but mining traffic. Um, however, trying to quantify that is tedious and difficult, so I left that on the back burner for now. Uh, this is the same thing, but with destination packets and destination bytes. So this is all the traffic that's getting sent to the mining server. As you can see, there's still, there's still a correlation there, for sure, but it's not nearly as tight as it is for the source, uh, the source data, the data that's coming back from the mining server back to the mining client. Uh, but it's still enough to work with. Uh, there's, it's hard to see here, but there's actually kind of a um, like honeycomb pattern on the, the structure of the, the points. I forgot to put in a screenshot of it zoomed in. I apologize. Um, but there's definitely some structural patterns here to be found as well. Uh, however, again, the, those kind of structural patterns have, can be very difficult to, to uh, compute, and so I put those on the back burners until I absolutely needed it. Uh, and then I went through and just graphed the other two pairs. So this, you can see, is not really as tightly correlated as all. The, the number of bytes sent from the source uh, and the number of bytes sent from the destination. A bit, but pretty weak. Um, so not a, good, not a great thing to build a model off of. Uh, and then finally, we have a uh, number of packets, to the number of source packets, and number of destination packets. This is another good tight grouping. So that's another um, another good place we could probably dive into. But those are the four metrics I'm going to be focusing on for now: uh, source, destination, and bytes, uh, or source bytes, destination bytes, source packets, and destination packets, or four dimensions of data. Um, so again, for our patterns, we got uh, fairly strong clustering as well as a very strong correlation between the two. Uh, with the strongest being among the source packets to the source bytes. Um, and then again, the striation of pattern that, it, that seems to appear on the source stream. Um, and then I don't know if you guys noticed, but there's actually points at zero, zero. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but all the way down here in the corner, uh, which I found particularly odd. I'm not quite sure why my mining client would go 10 minutes without sending or receiving data from a mining pool. I don't know if possibly my, uh, my mining pool went down for a while and I just didn't realize it. I didn't have any kind of... Um, uh, backup pools in place, which you can do if when you're mining, you can set multiple pools in, in your client. So if one goes down, you automatically connect to another. I didn't have anything like that. So it's very likely a pool just went down for a period of time and I, I wasn't monitoring it. I just let it run and then tore it down. Um, so that's probably what happened at that point. Uh, but I didn't dig into it too much. I just noted it, it was there and then left it as is. Uh, so building a model, we, we have some patterns, uh, clustering and correlation. Uh, so we're going to focus on clustering first. Uh, and the way I'm going to do this is by computing what's called the convex hull. Um, so if you're familiar, if anyone here is familiar with machine learning, this is somewhat similar to uh, defining a hyperplane with an SVM. 
Um, but since I only have one set of data, I don't have true and false data, I have just true data, I can't use an SVM. Um, so instead, I'm gonna define a convex hull. So this is what a convex hull is. Given a set of points, it just draws a hole around all of it, uh, as opposed to a concave hull. So it just defines the, the boundary, the, the absolute minimal boundary, uh, while still being, con being a convex polygon uh, around a set of points. So the idea is I take uh, my points, I de uh, define a hull around all of them, and then I filter, I feed all my non-mining traffic through, and I say, all right, for each pairing, each of these TCP pairs, um, how do they lie strictly within this polygon here, within this region that I've defined as where all mining traffic is? And if it's existing up here or down here, filter it out. It's not mining traffic, it's something else. Um, so I have this region defined via convex hull. And making it in Python is literally import sci-fi or sci-pi convex hull equals convex hull data. That's it. I'm not doing anything fancy here. I'm just importing all the NumPy and sci-pi libraries to do this for me. Um, and then same thing for the destination source and bytes. Uh, and you can actually see a, a little bit more of that honeycomb pattern starting to come out. Uh, these two graphs are uh, all my mining data shoved into one graph as opposed to individual miners. Um, so you can tell that there is there is overlap between all of them. It wasn't just uh, individual clustering. And again, destination pack is in source, a lot looser, uh, but still something there. We have, a, we have what appears to be a tight region, at least at the scale we have our, our graph set at. Um, but it seems strong enough that I figured I'd go and pipe it through. Uh, so with our defined hull, we have a hull for our source and our destination. We just pipe our data through it and see if, uh, I picked an arbitrary rate. So if 98% of the points and a set of traffic resided in, inside that <coughs> polygon, I said this might be mining data and I kept it in. If it was less than 98%, filtered it out. Um, that 98% was picked absolutely arbitrarily. I they had no good reason for it. I didn't do 100% on the off chance that for like this, it seems like there's a pretty good chance that at some point a point would end up outside this just because the clustering isn't that strong. So I went 98% just to try and reduce my uh, false negative rate. Um, that did not work too well. I went from 38,000 to 34,000. It, it, uh, it was kind of depressing when I ran that yesterday and it didn't do as good as I thought it would. But upon... Uh, oh, so... So to clarify a little bit, when I defined these convex holes, I wasn't actually using two holes, two hulls, and piping my data through it. I actually defined one, a four-dimensional. I took all my data and mapped it into a four-dimensional space and uh, calculated my convex hull from four dimensions. And that's because uh, defining a, or finding a hull for a point cloud is done via Euclidean distances, which means you can work in as many dimensions as you want. You're not restricted to just two or three. You can do as many as you want. Um, so, and that also reduces the amount of models I need to have. With one four-dimensional hull, I can I can uh, capture four metrics. Where if I have two two-dimensional hulls. Um, I, or if I have just two-dimensional holes, I need five different holes for all to capture all eight metrics. And that's obviously a pain. That's a lot more data to track. It's a lot more data processing. I have to, if I have to run my data through five different two-dimensional holes to see where the points lie. It's a ton of uh, processing power. Um, so instead, I just made a four-dimensional one and shoved uh, my bytes and my packets into it. Uh, so obviously, I can't graph that out. So anytime I talk about this, I'm just going to stick to the two-dimensional ones just to serve as, um, you can still see where like the false positive rates come through. Uh, and a point of note on this, if this is something you're interested in, the curse of dimensionality is something to keep in mind. Uh, the TLDR on it is basically once you start getting into like the hundreds or thousands of dimensions, these kind of techniques don't work because the volume of the area becomes so large, you need an ex a linear increase in dimensions results in an exponential requirement in data in order to properly fill it in order to get a proper uh, mapping of the entire space, a good representation of all your dimensions within a space. Um, I'm working in four, so this wasn't an issue, but it's worth bringing up just as a quick aside. Um, so with that in place, I went through, uh, and this, this was one of the ones that got filtered out. Uh, so the blue shaded area here is the, the convex hull that I defined, the source bytes and the source packets. Um, and here's some, some of my sample traffic down here. Does, none of it lies within the hull, except for this zero, zero point down here. 
Excuse me. Uh, very little bit lies with inside the hole, so it's pretty safe to say that's not mining traffic. Filter that out. Can ignore that for now. Um, oh, that was a bad slide. Um, however, for our false positive rate, I was getting a lot of graphs like this, which is, you probably can't see it, it's a stack of points down here around the zero, zero point. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of my false positive rate was down, was just graphs of points down here, very low number range, um, which causes problems, uh, but it was also very easy to filter out. Uh, so what I did is I just stripped out zeros. Uh, all, for all my data, I just, out of the convex hull definition, I stripped out any points that were zero, 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 because four dimensions. And I did the same thing for all the data that I was piping in. I just ignored anything that was lying at, at the origin. Uh, cause I just don't care about it. It's just not relevant to the model I want to build and it's causing a huge false positive rate. Um, so instead, I, I stripped that out, I built a new hull, and then piped all my data back through it again to see if I could get a better reduction than 10% or whatever it was. Um, and that did it. Uh, so in this case, that last one that I had, that true negative, um, or, or that, that previous false positive is now a true negative because uh, I axed off this tiny little tip here because it's no longer part of the convex hull. And now all those data points that were lying down here at the zero, zero are null and void. I don't care about them anymore. They get filtered out. They're not part of the hull. Uh, their membership rate is under 98%. And so it's got marked as non-traffic, non-mining traffic. That, I mean, that was it. That took me from, uh, I have the wrong figure again, 19K. It took me from 34K down to four. Not 4K, four. So out of 38,000 samples, that convex, convex hull method was enough to strip out 99.9% .9 of the false positives in there. Or 99% of the non-mining traffic, I should say, not false positives. Um, I did get a couple. I mean, this is just a quick GIF, and it's it's again, it's it's single points that just happen to lie within my hull. Um, and I mean, this really highlights the weakness of just using this as a methodology because while we managed to accurately capture the area at which points lie, I have done nothing to quantify the structure of the data by any means. Uh, nothing about the distribution or how many points there are or how how much traffic is occurring. If I'm getting uh, big spikes of traffic at 10 a.m. and then nothing for the next 36 hours. That's not, a, that's not how a mining client would behave. It would be steady traffic for at least a portion of the day. Otherwise, your adversary is not making any money off of you. Um, so filtering these out is very easy. And any one of those methods, I, I mean, th there's a lot of different ideas I have for how to go through next. Um, and I haven't, I've like half implemented a good number of these, but I haven't fully implemented them yet because I'm out of test data. And so without having more test data that's getting through the original filter, I haven't, I don't know which route is the best to take. Um, some easy ones I'd be able to do would be like the size of the hull. So if I were to go back here and compute the convex hull for these points and then the, get the size of it, it would be incredibly small because it's a single point. And the size of that is way less than the size of the convex hull we have for our mining data. So we can tell, so we're basically calculating the amount of area that our points take up on a graph. Um, that would immediately wipe those off and it'd be a fairly cheap computation. Um, finding the area of a polygon is nothing crazy. Even in four dimensions, it's not that difficult to do. Um, so that, that would be easiest. There's also um, a metric that's very popular in machine learning called nearest neighbor. Um, and what you do is you just take the mean and you take for every point, you find its closest point to it, sum that up, and then take the mean and the median of it, as well as the minimum and the maximum. And you can use that to get a very easy, quick eyeball at the structure of your data. So for something like this, your nearest neighbor, where you have a ton of points just overlapping each other, your mean, median, min, and max is all going to be zero. So that's telling you that you just have a thousand points just overlaid directly on top of each other. Where if you have something like our, something like this, well actually, something like this, we can see that points are fairly equidistant to each other, not perfectly equidistant by any means, um, but or at least around this center, like two thirds, things tend to be pretty, uh, pretty close to each other or pretty equidistant to each other. So that right there would probably be a good metric. Um, the problem is, is that mean and medians are not uh, perfectly representative of uh, how homogenous a space may be. So you could have identical mean, median, nearest neighbors on two separate graphs, and one graph might be perfectly equidistant, like a perfect grid that's equally spaced. And another graph, you'll have two tight clusters on two spots. The mean, median, min, and max is the same, but um, the, the graph uh, distribution is much different. 
So while a nearest neighbor is quick and dirty, it doesn't give you uh, a perfectly accurate uh, representation of how spread out your points are, uh, how what the what they actually look like within a space. Um, so if you want to get really uh, computationally expensive, there's a uh, set of theorems involved in what's called spatial homogeneity, which is basically, and it's the Ripley K and Ripley L functions. And what they do is they quantify how evenly distributed a set of points are uh, in a graph. So if everything is equally spread out, one units, you'll have a perfect one on your Ripley K or Ripley L score. Uh, or if you have everything clustered together on top of each other, you have a zero. Because um, things, well, actually, you'd still have one if they're clustered on top of each other. But if you had two sets of points stacked on each other, your Ripley L function would be very, very, very low because you you have a lot of points that are directly on top of each other, but also a lot of points that are very far away. Um, so that's the that's the expensive way to go about doing spatial homogeneity. You could also one thing I want to do is also uh, something with concentric circles. So if you just look at the center center of your hull, and then just do point distances in a set of in a set of concentric circles. You could eyeball somewhat the the spread of the graph in a way. Um, it, that's a cheap and another. It's another inaccurate one. It wouldn't be perfect. It suffers from the same kind of faults that uh, nearest neighbor would. Uh, but it's it's quick and dirty, and it may be enough. Uh, again, quantifying striations that would be another way to go. But again, that's again, it seems uh, too difficult. Difficult in terms of the amount of time that it would take to actually go through and test that, even after the model's built, would take a long time. Um, Timestamp analysis is really the big one, though. That's probably one that would be very easy to do and would quickly filter things out because you can filter out any kind of bursty traffic. What you're looking for is something that's sending traffic for several hours at a time, continuously, very repetitively. A couple spikes here and there for if you find a block and commit a share. Um, but otherwise, it's going to be fairly even predictable traffic over a long period of time. Um, and the final one you can do is anything with like linear aggression. So if you're familiar with linear aggression, basically you take a set of points. So we'll go back to here. Oh, we'll go here. So you take a set of points and basically you find a line that is as close to every single point as you can possibly get. So you define a straight line that cuts right through the middle of your cluster. Um, and from there, you can do things like find the average distance from each point to your linear regression line. You can do angles. So I can see here, the angle here is probably like around 45 degrees. Uh, where if I have a linear regression line for this, this is down here at 12 degrees or something like, like that, 15 degrees. Um, finding the linear regression line is a little bit more expensive, um, but it would be a fairly reliable, if not somewhat duplicate effort when it comes to like the convex hull, you're kind of stepping on its toes in terms of what you're actually quantifying. Um, so those are the, a handful of ideas I had for just what to do next in terms of filtering out other things that I come across. Um, next comes optimization. I, I haven't benchmarked this at all. I, I know it performs, I can run through three weeks of data in about four minutes on my rinky dink OSX laptop. Um, if you actually put it on a server or like a real beefy server, it'd do a lot better. Um, but that I still haven't benchmarked it. There's probably wide ranges of improvements to do. My code is horribly unoptimized because it's basically a 2000 line Python sandbox that I've been working on for several months now. Um, so there's definitely a lot of things I can do in terms of memory management and uh, uh, it's all single threaded too. I haven't done any kind of threading or multiprocessing. So there's a lot of room for improvement here. Um, so after this model is built, I still have a lot of work to do in terms of optimization and reducing the time for ex the time to execute. Um, Mostly because if this was to get ever implemented against a set of flow logs, you're going to be bottlenecked in execution time. If you're running against uh, something, a, a public website that gets millions of visitors a day, that's a lot of traffic to filter through. So you really need to get that locked down so it's executing as fast as possible. So you don't have this huge three C5, 16Xs in the background running 24-7 just to do this one really niche pseudo IDS thing. Um, so that's really something you have to focus on. Uh, in the near term. Um, before I can really dig into any more model building, uh, I need more data. I'll be the first to admit, I don't have a lot of mining data. 12 sets of mining clients running for 24 hours is not a lot. Um, I also intentionally reduced uh, the difference in the kinds of things I was collecting. So the only thing that differed between each client was how big the server was. Otherwise, it was mining the same coin against the same pool on the same port with the same difficulty um, so I don't know how much those things would affect uh, my resulting data. Again, I'm fingerprinting stratum, not the coin itself. 
So it likely would not be, make a difference, but should still probably verify that. Um, and there's some variety between pools too that may change things, such as uh, how often you get reward payouts, what the reward payout system is. That's what PPLNS and PPS are different uh, reward systems that pools will leverage. Um, different difficulties. Uh, th there's a handful of configuration settings that may or may not influence uh, what the traffic looks like. Um, solo mining is a big one. I, I actually do have some solo mining traffic and it looks very different from this, uh, but I haven't gone through and done anything yet. Uh, it looks like it'll be a lot easier because it was very, very, very tight clustering around a very small portion. Um, so that one should be pretty easy to, to uh, build a model off of. Um, and then rejected traffic. Uh, so uh, miners that are trying to reach out to their mining pool but can't get there. For whatever reason, you manage to compromise a box, but there's a knackle in the way that's preventing you from getting outbound traffic out to your pool so you can start mining. Uh, that is still very good to know. You're, you've been compromised. There's someone on your network. They may not be burning through your CPU, but someone's there. Um, and I also need a lot more non-mining data. So if anyone wants to donate me some VPC blogs, I'm all ears. <laughs> I need a lot more data. Um, I've been begging people left and right for it. Um, but I mean, that's it. I mean, that, that, that's pretty much all I've done for this so far. It, it didn't really have to get too deep into it before I stripped out all my data. Um, as for what I used, like I said, big Python fan, NumPy and SciPy are the two modules I used. They're probably the most popular uh, modules to be using for this kind of stuff. Um, they abstract away a lot of the uh, math. Like, I, again, I don't know math, and I was able to graph this stuff out pretty easily. Matplotlib is fairly straightforward to use once you get the hang of it. Um, and if you're interested in this kind of stuff at all, I'd highly recommend the book, Algorithms of the Intelligent Web, uh, specifically the second edition. Uh, it's really short. It's like 130 pages long, and it's built uh, specifically for someone who knows a bit of Python and a bit of math, or at least enough math that you can go through and Google the stuff you don't know. I know I spent like a good week on the first two chapters just because I had to go back and relearn. Like they would talk about uh, mathematic topics that I'm not familiar with. So I had to go research and learn that on the back end, strictly out of curiosity. It really wasn't necessary for me to implement a lot of that. Um, and again, using Python. Uh, and there's a bit of an expectation for NumPy. So that was the other part of my Googling was trying to figure out what the hell their syntax was doing. Um, NumPy has what's called ND arrays, n-dimensional arrays. They function very similar to lists, but they have a lot more uh, power to them, and so some of the syntax is not familiar to me. Uh, so that took some a uh, bit, bit of a learning curve. Um, but if you're interested at all, great book, really cheap, really easy to get into. It's a fairly light read in the sense that you're not going to be popping open a linear algebra textbook or anything like that. Uh, oh yeah, and again, if you're feeling generous, I could use some logs. Um, yeah, that's about it. I, I, I dumped these slides off on SlideShare. Uh, the link's right here if you want to take a picture of it and dig them up later. Uh, I don't know if there's a distro list or anything, but I'd be happy to mail them out too if you're interested. Um, email me, Twitter, whatever. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. Any questions or anything? Thank you. Questions? Cool. Yeah. Yeah, you used them. Convex file to define the first filter to see what they want to look at. Mm -hmm. You just import the matches at once. Yeah. But uh, doesn't that create a whole lot of extra volume that you don't need? Just mean that uh, a really raw filter? It, it would. And that's why, so uh, when I, I tested it first. I wasn't sure if it would actually work. But because I was able to go I filter out all but four of my streams, I ended up sticking with it. It is very likely that somewhat sometime in the future, when I do have more data, that doesn't end up being a good filter. Um, but because my, my, um, my strategy here is basically to stack a bunch of filters on top of each other, it seems like it'll get, it gets out at least some stuff. It may not be everything, but it's a first start. And building uh, a second filter and a third filter behind that is really going to depend on the kind of test data I can get and whether or not that hole is actually representative of, uh, or if there, what kind of traffic could fit inside that hole that isn't mining traffic? What kind of uh, false positives come out of that or, uh, yeah, false positives come out of that filter. Um, so, so yeah, it's the same, it would be the same as doing uh, two two-dimensional holes, mostly the same. You, again, exponential volume growth. So yes, a four-dimensional hole does have more area than two two-dimensional holes. Um, so I may also need just more test data too to make sure that my hole is uh, accurately uh, filled volume-wise. And I have a good amount of test data that represents all four dimensions.
we're able to find out what caused uh, <clears throat> what caused the, the patterns you observe. No, I haven't yet. I, I and I need to dig into the actual stratum protocol itself. I'm aware of it. I know it's a REST API, but I haven't really spent much time digging into the meat of it. And I would expect that when looking at it, there's only four or five different API calls you can make, and they have very very similar or e- each call is going to have a very, very similar body size. So um, as these calls go out, uh, there, there's a strong correlation between the number of packets and the number of data that gets sent, um, it, or at least when it comes back from the server. As you can see, when going out, that's very different. And that's probably because there's a big change in the amount of data the miner's sending back to the server. But the server's sending back pretty much the same thing every time. Just work on this. Yes, I accept your share. No, I don't accept it. Or whatever other uh, control patterns that may come out of that to talk to the client. Um, but I would imagine that it's a manifestation of it just being a very simple and small API without a lot of uh, variation in the kind of data that gets sent. Uh, yeah. The destination one is more interesting. The, the honeycomb pattern is, intuitively, I don't know why that would happen. The, the striation one makes more sense, to, at least to me. But um, yeah, no, no, but no, to answer your question, I haven't dug into that. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys.